And the rest of yous can turn to Genesis chapter 7. Genesis chapter 7. We are back in Genesis. In fact, the last time we were in Genesis was May 15th, in which we took into consideration all of the attributes of God, not just His grace and His mercy and His kindness and His tenderness and His fluffy, lovey, gushy-wushy side, but we also looked into the wrath and the jealousy and the justice of God, and I challenged you all to consider the God that you worship. Is the God you worship the God of the Bible, or is the God you worship the God of your own desire? Um, and I challenge you, of course, as one who claims to be a Christian, which means follower of Christ, that you are hopefully a, God, a Christian who is uh, worshiping the God of the Bible. In fact, Jesus, uh, he often quoted from the book of Genesis. He quoted from the Old Testament, from the prophets, from the Psalms. And so therefore, Jesus confirmed the Old Testament uh, revelation of God, of himself. I've heard it said that, well, the God of the New Testament is different than the God of the Old Testament. And I say to you that it cannot possibly be. The God of the Old Testament, of the New Testament, is the same God. Yes, we have different covenants, but it is the same God. He has the same attributes, the same characteristics. What made him angry, what was detestable and made him angry in the Old Testament, still makes him angry today. And yes, God is an angry God, but he is also a patient God. He is exceedingly more patient than you or I or anybody else that you know. But he still does have a limit. His tolerance, his patience, his common grace for all mankind has a limit. And when, we, when he reaches that limit, we see his wrath, we see his justice, we see his jealousy on display. And so I challenge you to consider the flood, not in the way that we were taught as children, that we focus primarily on the animals and the cute side of it, but I, I wanted you to really just examine and focus the fact that the God of the Bible killed every single man, woman, child, creature on earth, all but eight people. I want you to really let that sink in because that is a reality of the Bible. I wanted you to also think about the fact that God, uh, beyond the flood, that he also caused his wrath to come out locally on Sodom and Gomorrah, for example, on Jericho, on the enemies of Israel. God would have his people come in and completely kill every single person or creature in a culture. And this was from God's decree. This was from God's command. And this is not something we as Christians should sweep under the carpet. And I think we often do. In fact, when I went to Bible college, I remember people's minds were blown because they were never, ever taught these things. You know, yeah, they'd read through the Bible, but they just kind of sweep it under the rug. And they never really considered the fact that God is a wrathful God. That God is a just God. That God does have a limit to his patience and his tolerance with his creatures that he has made. And so I hope over the last three weeks that you have considered that. And you have considered whether you're still willing to stand up and proclaim in a song that God is beautiful despite these things. And I, and I hope even in spite of these things, I hope it causes you to worship him even more. Because we know that God is good, and we know that when he makes a declaration of, ju of judgment, that it is good and it is uh, worthy of worship. In fact, if you look at a lot of the Psalms, um, what are some of the Psalms of David? He is praising God for the fact that he conquered his enemy, that he was able to kill and conquer his enemy. These are in worship songs of old. We don't sing songs like that anymore, like, Thank you, Lord, for allowing SEAL Team 6 to put a bullet through Bin Laden's head. <laughs> I mean, that's basically the equivalent. Uh, if we would write songs like that today, and, and I think um, I saw an interview with uh, Bono from U2. I think Greg showed it to me. And uh, he was interviewing with Eugene Peterson, who was the guy responsible for the Message Bible. And he was talking about how 
you wish that Christians would be more honest, uh, more honest with their worship, that, that songs would not be cookie cutter worship songs, you know, anymore, but, but songs like the Psalms of David, you know, ones that are honest about what's going on in culture today and honest about what's good and what's bad. So I thought that was very insightful. So the question is, are you willing to worship the God of the Bible, or are you only willing to worship the God of your own desires, or the God that the culture hopes that God would be? And then, following that, uh, Brad Coe gave an excellent message on the question of salvation. Uh, are you saved? How do you know if you're going to escape the wrath of God? Um, and he broke that out wonderfully. And he, I hope, challenged you to question your own faith, even if you've been attending church your whole life, even if your parents attended church their whole life. Um, I hope you really challenged your own salvation, because the Bible tells us to do that. It tells us to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. So I hope that you spent the last couple of weeks working out your salvation. And then last week, of course, was a Memorial Day service. Many of you, I don't think we're here. Um, <laughs> Many of you were camping or, or what have you. Uh, but it was a wonderful service, and um, we had some honored speakers. If you missed it, then you missed out. Uh, Glenn Willis gave a, a wonderful presentation. He talked about some of his fallen brothers in arms, um, and he, he gave a good gospel presentation. John Willie, who's not here today, also gave a presentation and testimony. And if you think I'm long-winded, then... Uh, <laughs> Uh, these guys could outdo me any day. Uh, they are very good. And so we had a really good service. We had communion. Um, it was just a real good time. And so now we find ourselves back in Genesis. And as I told you three weeks ago, uh, we're going to put on the brakes again. And I want to look at Genesis chapter 7 from, different, from a different angle. We looked at it from the angle of the character of God and can you worship that God. Uh, this week and next week, I want to look at it from a scientific angle. And let me say from the offset that uh, science is not my specialty. It is not my life's work. I know a thing or two about science, but I uh, primarily am relying upon the work of those whose field it is their expertise, uh, mainly on um, creation scientists, but also I think it's responsible to look at secular science as well to look at both equally and objectively and to try and find somewhere in there the truth. So uh, I've been able to do that the last couple weeks and I think we're going to enjoy what we have today. Some people view the Bible as a good moral book. In fact, when they start to teach their children the Bible, oftentimes they just enjoy the fact that they can teach their children some moral stories. We talked about uh, Noah's Ark, how oftentimes as children, we just learn about the animals. You know, we show kids animals, and kids love the animal portion of it. They love the idea of the ark and, and this uh, portable zoo floating on the water. Children love that aspect of it. But when we come to a certain age in our life, we have to decide, is it just a moral story or was it a literal event? Was it some kind of a myth that uh, God presented to his people to, to cause them to want to be moral, or did it actually literally happen? And many of you already know that uh, I'm a literalist when it comes to the Bible. Um, that's my consistent uh, exegetical approach to the Bible, that it's literal, that when God says that it happened this way, that it happened this way. Unless, of course, he says it in an allegorical way, a clearly allegorical way. And so my goal this morning, hopefully, is to convince you that you don't have to abandon sound reason or science to believe in the events of Noah and the Ark as a literal event that occurred just as the Bible taught it. You do not have to abandon it. You don't have to abandon your Christianity to believe these things, and you don't have to abandon uh, scientific reasoning to believe these things, and that's what I hope to leave with today. Also, since the uh, schools refuse to teach, um, public schools anyway, refuse to teach uh, any kind of creation science, which there's a lot, there's a lot of material, a lot of sound, rational, 
reasonable science to back up creation science. Uh, but the, uh, the Board of Education and, and uh, National Education refused to allow these things to even be taught as an option or as a theory. And so this morning, this may be the first time you've ever heard some of this information. And uh, I would encourage you, there's a lot of material out there. I would encourage you to start with, um, actually I think I might have to go, but you got it. <laughs> uh, this is a really good documentary. If you, how many of you have seen this? Many of you have. Uh, ben Stein, of course, he's from Ferris Bueller's Day Off. He's one of Bueller, Bueller, that's what he's most famous for. But he put together this uh, documentary that exposes the, the bias and the hypocrisy of, um, of education in public schools when it comes to science and when it comes to what people are allowed to be taught. Uh, any kind of um, tenured college professor, if he were to suddenly try and teach any kind of creation science whatsoever, even if it's sound and backed up by evidence, then they could be stripped of their tenure, they could be stripped of their ability to teach in public schools. Anyway, a really good expose of, of that scenario. If you've never seen it, um, check it out for yourself and it'll give you a lot of good information. So we're gonna get into the word now and uh, let's say a word of prayer and we'll get going. Father, I thank you for this time together, Lord. I thank you um, so much for the church not just as a building, not just as uh, new chairs or any of the kind of logistics that go on uh, to make a, a church and its building work. But Father, I thank you for the church, the ecclesia, the body of believers that come together, whether it's at home uh, in a group, whether it's uh, across the world, Lord, your church, I thank you for your church. It's such a blessing to be able to come together with like-minded people, people who believe the Bible as, as I do. Uh, what a joy that is. And I pray today that we are all encouraged by your word, that, uh, that things, our worldview becomes clear because of your word, and help us, Lord, to go out and not be afraid to share our worldview uh, with other people. And so, Father, we thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, so Genesis chapter 7, let's go back just to give a little context in Genesis chapter uh, 6, verse 11, and we'll read up through 7 a little bit. So Genesis chapter 6, verse 11, says, Now the earth was corrupt in the sight of God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked on the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way upon the earth. Then God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. Behold, I am about to destroy them with the earth. Make for yourself an ark of gopher wood. You shall make the ark with rooms and shall cover it inside and out with pitch. And this is how you shall make it the length of the ark, 300 cubits, its breadth, 50 cubits, and its height, 30 cubits. You shall make a window for the ark and finish it to a cubit from the top and set the door of the ark in the side of it. You shall make it with lower, second, and third decks. Behold, I, even I, am bringing the flood of water upon the earth to destroy all the flesh in which is in the breath of life. From under heaven, everything that is on the earth shall perish. But I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. And every living thing of all flesh you shall bring two of every kind into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female. Of the birds after their kind, and of the animals after their kind, of every creeping thing of the ground after its kind, two of every kind shall come to you to keep them alive. And as for you, take for yourself some of all food which is edible, and gather it to yourself, and it shall be for food for you and for them. Thus Noah did according to all that God had commanded him, uh, so he did. Then the Lord said to Noah, Enter the ark, you and your household, for you alone I have seen to be righteous before me in this time. You shall take with you of every clean animal by sevens, a male and his female, and of the animals that are not clean, two, a male and his female, also of the birds of the sky by sevens, male and female, to keep offspring alive on the face of the earth. For after seven more days I will send rain on the earth forty days and forty nights, 
and I will blot out from the face of the land every living thing that I have made. And Noah did according to all that the Lord had commanded him. And Noah was 600 years old when the flood of waters came upon the earth. And Noah and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him went into the ark to escape the waters of the flood, of clean animals and of animals that are not clean and of birds and of every thing that creeps on the ground, two and two, male and female, went into the ark with Noah, as God had commanded Noah. And after seven days, the waters of the flood came upon the earth. We're going to stop there. So I want you to first of all notice the age of Noah when the waters of the flood came. How old was he? 600 years old. And that's pretty old. I want you to think of your lifespan. Um, how many of you here are over 50? Okay. And would you say that your skill or your trade that you've gotten to the point where you've pretty much mastered it, the thing that you're most passionate about, uh, your life's work, so to speak, that, that you've pretty much mastered it to the point where you could teach other people how to do it, right? For the most part. Now I want you to imagine living 600 years, applying yourself to that which you are passionate about, that, that which you are gifted in, and that which you um, commit your life's work to. Now imagine how masterful you would be at your craft. Gosh, I think about all the work that's left uh, that could be done in the work of textual criticism and church history and apologetics and preaching and teaching, all the work that could be put into that in a lifetime, and it still wouldn't be enough time to, to become you know, the, just a supreme, masterful preacher, teacher, pastor. And I imagine 600 years, man, oh, what I love 600 years to devote to my life's work. How good you could become, how much you could learn, how much you could teach to other people. And here, Noah, is 600 years old by the time the flood came. Not only that, but even after the flood, he ultimately lived to be 950 years old. That's 20 years longer than Adam. So the people of that time, because of the purity of their biology, because they were the closest thing to a purely created human being that you could be, um, we are far removed from that now, obviously. We have plenty of problems, people getting sick for months and months and months, uh, just our biology is breaking down, we're, we're far from that purity that God first created Adam and Eve. But these people were close, and so they lived to be 900 plus years old sometimes. Imagine a Steve Jobs living to be 900 years old. Imagine the kind of things that Steve Jobs could build and make. Uh, imagine. imagine the people he could teach to, to learn what he knows the kind of things that they could make. So I made a challenge to you some months ago um, to consider that this early, uh, this early um, society, this early world, could have been well more advanced than we often give them credit for. We often think of these people as primitive people using stone tools and things like that. But if you consider that they lived that long, if you consider that they had probably hundreds of children because of the purity of their biology, and that those children had hundreds of children, and so on and so forth. You could imagine the types of things that Steve Jobs, for example, uh, could invent. So I would assert that this early society, um, maybe not as advanced as, as advanced as we are today, but maybe close, maybe even early 1900s type advanced technology. I would assume that could be true. Also, if we look here, you, you read about the clean animals and uh, the not-so-clean animals. And this, the reason for this, I think, is pretty obvious. Because what happens if Adam brings two of every kind, a creature, clean and unclean, and, and all the general animals as well, onto the ark? They get off of the ark, and he sacrifices the clean animals. What's going to happen to those animals? Extinction, right? Done and done. So it's pretty obvious. Genesis 8, 20 says, uh, right after they got off the ark, Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took some of every clean animal and some of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. So the inclusion of this is obvious. 
Um, they needed the, these extra animals to uh, perform the, uh, the sacrifice. This also tells us that the knowledge of a Levitical kind of sacrifice was already in place. The people were already aware that because of sin, that God's good character required some kind of atonement. They were already aware of this. It was already in practice. When we get to chapter 8, we're going to look at that in much more depth. But it's good to be aware of that early on. Finally, a uh, seven-day packing process. So here in the end, after all the preparations were made, for seven days they knew that the flood was coming, so they were making final preparations. Um, think about when you go on a trip, like a long trip, a week-long trip, long, long trip, however long it is. And think of the preparations you make and how you, you pack everything. You make a list, you check it twice, um, and you, you pack everything early on. You get everything loaded up into your vehicle. And the last thing to go is, you know, you get the kids in there, get them all good. You do one more run through through the house. Okay, do we got everything? Are we absolutely sure? Let's check the list just one more time. You do that. And the last people into your vehicle are usually the driver and the passenger, mom and dad. And then away you go. So in the same way, they were making final preparations. They were making, checking their list. Okay, do we have this animal? It's a big list. Do we have this animal? Do we have this animal? Do we have food for the animals? Do we have uh, food for ourselves? Do we have the clean animals? Do we have the unclean animals? You know, do we have everything that we need? Okay, uh, we're good. We're good. These seven days, we're packing. And so, away they go. Now, we're going to stop there, and I want to examine the science. And I want to examine uh, two fields. Uh, one, architectural science. We're going to take a look at, is it feasible that Noah and his family could have built the ark as described in the Bible? Is it feasible? Some scientists would say absolutely not. We're also going to look at, is it feasible that such a structure could actually float on top of the water as it did? And we're going to look at that. We're also going to look at zoology. How on earth could it be feasible that... Noah and his family could pack all of the creatures according to their kind, male and female, onto such a structure. Is that even possible? So we want to look at that objectively as well. <coughs> While I was doing some studying, I came across a uh, really useful debate. And this debate was between Bill Nye, the science guy. How many of you guys grew up watching Bill Nye work? Or younger, watching Bill Nye the Science Guy. Uh, Bill Nye the Science Guy, who, by the way, is a uh, staunch atheist. He is best buddies with Bill Maher, if that tells you anything. Um, he seems to demonstrate and display a kind of a hatred towards uh, Christian and uh, creationist viewpoints. And so Bill Nye was in a debate versus creationist Ken Ham. And during this debate, Bill Nye, part of his argumentation was that how could a primitive, unskilled man and his family possibly build such a structure in their time? How could they possibly build something that would uh, withstand the water uh, the way that the Bible describes it? And part of that comparison is, he brought up, thank you Greg for putting that up, uh, he brought up in the early 1900s in New England, there was a ship that was built, and it was called the Wyoming. And it was built by some of the most skilled architects of the time, shipmakers uh, and architects and builders. At the time, it was the largest wooden six-masted schooner ever built. He claims that this ship was so large that, anybody know what happened to this ship? It sunk sunk. And he says the reason why it sunk, the science behind it, is because it was so large, just made out of wood, that it just shifted. It constantly just flexed, and it shifted, and eventually just started leaking and sunk into the sea. He also mentions that there were 14 crewmen on board, who were skilled crewmen, and he compares this with the eight unskilled, so he says, uh, crewmen of Noah's family. Also, not only that, but they had to tend to all the animals as well. 
So how could they have possibly made this work? It's impossible, it's unfeasible, it's, it's a myth. That's, that's his proclamation. So his assertion is that Noah's 500-foot wooden boat with only eight crewmen could not have withstood uh, the flood if the 400-foot Wyoming with 14 crewmen could not have withstood the sea. Now, I would say that's an absolutely fair assertion. Okay, you know, what do we do in science? We, we make comparisons. We compare things. We go through the scientific method to find out if something is, is uh, true or not. So I'd say that's fair, and I think we need to address it. The easy response from Christians, and I've often heard this, in fact, I asked yesterday, and this, this was the exact response I got, was that, well, it's, you know, God supernaturally oversaw the process, and he, he made it work. And, well, I absolutely believe that God is a God of miracles, amen? I mean, human life, creation itself, that is a huge miracle. When you have a child and you see childbirth, miracle. Uh, we've even heard and read of supernatural events taking place that doctors cannot explain, nobody can explain. Uh, healing, um, we've seen that through Jonathan. We've, we've seen certain things that just defy explanation, defy science, and uh, of course is surrounded by the prayers of believers. So we have seen miracles. We know that miracles exist. We know that God uh, interacts supernaturally. God is supernatural. We cannot make God into some naturalistic being. God is supernatural. He operates within the natural, but he is supernatural. And so we must never deny that God is miraculous. But on the other hand, I say, how are we going to evangelize to people such as Bill and I, or people such as my wife, for example, who is already in the world, but who have a scientific brain? who think of things in a natural sense. Usually that's their first knee-jerk response is, okay, how does this make sense rationally and reasonably, and how can we put it together on paper in a scientific method and, and reproduce such an event? Whereas myself, uh, we complement each other very well. I, I tend to lean on the, the spiritual uh, faith side, where I tend to lean on the, well, we need to just stop and pray. God, God can take care of us, so let's stop and pray. Um, and she's sitting here thinking in her mind on her sketch pad, like how we're going to make this work ourselves. And together it, it just blends perfectly. Uh, that's why I would argue that we have the greatest marriage on the face of the earth. Um, whereas you might disagree with you and your spouse. But in that same way, I think that science and faith in the supernatural um, can complement each other very well. But that means that we have to be willing to look and see, is it feasible? that Noah's Ark could have been built and could work um, according to the Bible. And I say yes, I say yes. And here's my, here's my argumentation. Number one, I want to point to the length of life. I talked about this a little bit already. At the length of life, I would say uh, Bill Nye is wrong that these would have been primitive people. I would say that they could have been well advanced even as we were in the 1900s. Um, Noah was 600, um, I don't know where 690 came from, it might be a type. He was 600 when the flood came, so he had 600 years to develop his skills in, uh, in architecture. Maybe that was his trade, the Bible doesn't say specifically. God maybe gifted him that way. Um, I believe it was an advanced society. I believe that the tools that they had available to build such a boat would have been available to them. Not to mention that the Bible says it was built with gopher wood. We don't know what this gopher wood was. Could this be a kind of a wood that maybe went extinct, so to speak, um, at the flood? Maybe it was stronger. Maybe it was like, like a stronger but a lighter material. We don't know. We don't know. So there's a possibility. There's a theory. Uh, the length of human life, I think, lends to the idea that these would not have been primitive people, as some people think. Second point, length of time. God gave Noah over 100 years. He gave him 120 years to build this project. Okay? So in 120 years, if you were committed to this one thing, one thing, I mean, if God came to you and said, Larry, 
I want you to build the best hot rod the world has ever seen. And it's going to be huge, and it's going to be fast, and it's going to be powerful, and I, guess what? I'm going to give you 120 years to do it. And it's going to save all of humanity through you and this hot rod. Now, don't you think you would spend every single day, day in and day out, focused on this project, and that you would have the leverage you need to tell your wife, honey, God gave you these instructions, I need to be out here in the shop working on this hot rod. And then she would be behind you, the kids would be behind you, you'd all be working together to build this hot rod. Imagine how amazing this thing could be. 120 years. I mean, we can hardly find enough time to tinker with the vehicles that we have now just to make them work, right? Imagine if you had all that time to do that. So I would say that length of time, um, Noah could have very well, Noah and his, his sons could have very well built such a structure. I would also like to uh, suggest that perhaps they had help. Um, the Bible doesn't say specifically whether they had help or not. So there's a possibility that they did. There's a possibility that they had hired hands. People who didn't go with them on the boat, but who he said, tell you what, you know, I'll pay you this amount of money if, if you would help me out on this project. They probably, while they're working on it, think he's a lunatic, but they're like, hey, we're going to pay. Uh, who knows, maybe he had servants at the time, slaves, whatever. It's a possibility. So if he had that help, it would make it a lot more feasible that him and the help that he had uh, made that work. Fourth point, uh, let's look to modern examples. Arc, modern arc architecture. There there's, must be something in the water, there must be something by way of the Holy Spirit that is telling certain people across the world that they need to build life-size, uh, two-scale models of the arc. And right now there are two major projects that I'm aware of. One is called the Ark Encounter which is actually being uh, directed by uh, Bill Ham, which is the same guy who debated Bill Nye, or sorry, Ken Ham, the same guy who debated Bill Nye in this debate that I was talking about. Uh, he is the director of this project, it's called the Ark Encounter, and it's located in Williamstown, Kentucky, halfway between Cincinnati and Lexington on I-75. And so um, I wanted to go ahead and show a, a brief video about this project. This, this is like happening now. But how that lends to uh, the argument that it's feasible that Noah and his family could have built the ark is the fact that we're seeing people actually do it. Um, and some people might say, well, yeah, but they have all this modern technology, these cranes, this whole group of workers, but they're doing this like in a matter of five to ten years. It's only taken them five to ten years. Imagine 120 years with skilled laborers and possibly similar kind of technology. There, that's not the only one. You may wonder, well, that's great for a commercial success, you know, uh, having zip lines and restaurants and, you know, but can it float? Will it actually float? Well, there's actually uh, another guy in the Netherlands um, who is building the same thing at the same time. It's incredible. Uh, Life-size, two-scale arc. But this one is actually in the water. It's actually designed to float. And so it's, it's almost done. And here, I believe, next month, there, it's weird how they're just coordinating this. Um, it's going to actually float from the Netherlands to Brazil. And it's going to be docks, and they're going to share the gospel there to people using the ark as um, a vessel to do that. And if you're like, oh, I can't ever go to Brazil, I can't ever see this thing. They're actually going to bring it over to the United States, and they're going to come up the West Coast. Which, hey, we're pretty close to that. So if you can't make it to Kentucky, maybe just wait for this thing to come along the West Coast, make a coast trip, and check it out. So all this to say that, yes, it is absolutely possible to build such a thing. And as we're seeing, um, it can be built, and it can float on the water. Uh, such a thing can be built. Finally, the argument I would make directly to Bill Nye is that the difference between the Wisconsin, the six-mast uh, schooner, and the Ark is that the schooner was meant to travel from point A to point B. It was a sailboat. It's meant to use the wind. And, and I don't know if you've seen these masts. They're, 
the, the wood that they use is very, very heavy. Um, if you consider that these masts are spread out throughout the ship, the wind that is blowing is, of course, going to flex in different directions. Uh, so the comparison is not good. Because what does the word ark mean in Hebrew? Do you remember? Basket. It means basket. It was designed to be a floating vessel, not a sailing vessel. So it would be, it would be much easier to design and build a boat to float than it would to design and build a boat to sail. Plus, you obviously wouldn't need the crewmen necessary to operate uh, such a rig. You would simply need to be on the rig and take care of the animals. You don't need to worry about uh, putting up and down the sails. You're simply floating, uh, just like Moses on his basket. Um, same word used, basket, down the river. So, so that's my argument for the architecture. I believe it's absolutely feasible. I believe we can explain it in a natural way. Of course, as he mentioned here, um, it's miraculous that he would be able to accomplish this, but at the same time, I believe it could be explained naturally. Uh, the second point, I want to talk about the zoological argument, in which in this same debate, and other scientists make, and other, maybe even yourself, uh, he wondered how could the animals possibly be loaded onto this craft? There would be far too many animals. He says there are some 14,000 species of animal, and that is impossible to fit onto such a structure. In fact, he points to the National Zoo in Washington, D.C., which has 163 acres with many skilled workers who can hardly maintain sufficient uh, feeding and care for the animals and, and fit them into proper spacing. In fact, many of us are getting tired of hearing of silverback gorillas from the Cincinnati Zoo and how apparently they're um, their preparations weren't good enough to keep kids out, and so on and so forth. Uh, so he makes that argument, that there's no way that these unskilled, primitive people could possibly care for these animals when our modern scientists are even having a difficult time. And I have a response to that. I believe it's absolutely feasible and possible that they could have done this. Uh, the first response is the same as the last one. You look at length of life. They could have had that amount of time to get to know the, uh, um, the animals, you know, their, their zoological understanding. Uh, they could have spent that amount of time. And also, uh, I wanted to mention too, I'm going to talk about this next week, when we're, all we're going to do is cover the geological aspect and arguments of the flood itself. But um, I believe it's very possible that all the continents were fit together to make one continent at one point, so when God created the heavens and the earth and the land, and the land was all together, and that through the flood and through earthquakes and things, that the, the plates that were underneath the continents split them apart, we have what they are now. Many, even secular scientists, uh, have theorized that, that that's very possible. So considering that, and considering that all the animals and everything on, on land and all the birds and everything were all in one localized giant continent, it's very possible to collect all these animals and it's very possible to learn about all these animals in the length of time that they lived. Also, you look at the length of time, again, used to, um, used to work on this project, 120 years, plenty of time. Help, also we look to that again, that's another argument I'm gonna make, that they probably had some help too. Uh, the unique argument here in the zoological argument is 14,000 species. Now that might be a textbook response to how many species there are on Earth right now, uh, but creation scientists would of course argue that there is a difference between species and kind, biblical kind. Because after all, you don't need to get a, a canine dog and a bulldog, you simply need to get a dog. And that is a dog of its kind. Kind is limited to just the type of animal in, in its own species. And so you wouldn't have to get all these variations of the kind. You'd simply have to get one of the kind. And so uh, we, there's plenty of books, actually. There's lots and lots of books. Libraries and libraries, libraries of books that explain what I'm explaining to you now. Uh, but the Genesis Flood... According to Drs. Morris and Whitcomb, 
say that only 3,500 individual animals, just individual animals, were needed to go into the ark. Uh, John Woodmorap, the author of Noah's Ark, a feasible study, <coughs> believes that an even smaller number of animals would have been transported upon the ark. And he argues and explains that the word species is not equivalent to the creature kinds of the Genesis cow, so as few as 2,000 animals may have been required on the ark. So regardless of the number, whether it's 2,000, <coughs> whether it's 3,500, uh, or 35,000, or whether it's the 14,000 species of Bill Nye, I still think it would be feasible, regardless. But I, I think as scientists, uh, we need to be willing to look into this idea of species versus kind. If we look at uh, microevolution, that we should be able to determine that, well, there needs to only be this amount of kind uh, for each variation of species. Some of this might be going over your head, but um, we need to examine this stuff. I don't think this is outside of the realm of science at all. And I don't think it's outside of the realm of faith at all. And the reason why I think it's feasible is my next point. Whenever you think of a picture of Noah's Ark, and you think of the line of animals that are walking into the side door of Noah's Ark, typically what do you think of? you think of grown animals. I mean, every, I, I went on Google, I looked up Noah's Ark, and every picture had a grown adult elephant walking into the ark. And I'm thinking to myself, what kind of zoologist in their right mind would pack a fully grown adult elephant into this wooden boat enclosure with all these other animals? I mean, Okay, would you do that with a silverback gorilla? A grown, would you rather have a grown silverback gorilla or a little baby silverback gorilla? <laughs> Obviously, if you have any kind of intelligence at all, you would pack babies, right? For a, a number of reasons. Number one, uh, their tameability. When they're babies, obviously they're, they're more susceptible to being tamed to their environment, whatever environment that is. Secondly, of course, would be their weight. A baby elephant weighs a lot less than an adult elephant, right? Um, if, you know, dinosaurs at that time, would you want a full-grown T-Rex on board with you? Or would you want a baby T-Rex? I choose the baby. A lot less to feed them as well, so when you're packing the food, it's a lot more feasible to feed all these baby animals. It's a lot more feasible that they wouldn't be uh, too hard to handle. Uh, so I say, break that conception from all these childhood stories that we've read of Noah's Ark, all these pictures that we've seen, that they're adult animals. I'm almost absolutely convinced they were baby animals. It would absolutely make sense if that was true. Finally, um, it's also possible, we're going to look at a supernatural idea here from the Bible, sedation. Um, supernatural sedation, we've seen this throughout the Bible. We saw it as early as uh, early Genesis in Adam. Adam was supernaturally sedated so that God could work an operation and create a woman. And so we've seen that happen. We've seen Abraham's deep sleep. We've seen uh, Saul's army, God caused a deep sleep to go upon. We've seen Job's declaration of deep sleep. So God could have very well, and it's not um, inconsistent with the Bible, he could have put these animals in some kind of sedation that caused them just to behave and be tame. So therefore, um, based off of these two things, the architecture and the zoology, I'm absolutely convinced that it is feasible that Noah and his family, maybe with some helpers over the span of 120 years with 600 years of experience, could have very well built the ark and could have very well maintained and kept the animals on the ark with, with great precision. I'm absolutely convinced. I hope that you are too. But what does this mean for us in closing? We do not have to abandon the Bible for science or science for the Bible. What did we just do here this morning? We went through a scientific process to try and explain how these things could have been absolutely feasible according to how the Bible predicts it. So don't abandon your science, don't abandon your faith, work it out, reason it out, don't fall back on the, well, it was probably just a miracle. Uh, 
think that can, can be a, um, just kind of a catch answer. You know, I, I, let's work it out. Because God does work through natural means as well as miraculous means. We have to find uh, the center. What does this also mean beyond this? Has God called you to do something? Has God called you to work in the church in some particular way? Has he called you to be an elder? Has he called you to be a deacon? Has he called you to be an usher, a musician? Uh, what has he called you to do? Has he called you to be a missionary? Has he called you to be somebody who just shows up every Sunday and is compassionate for people and is looking for hurting people that you can pray for? What has God called you to do? Because if you are a believer, if you have been saved by Jesus Christ, then you are a member of the church. You are the hands and the feet of the church. You may not be able to build a giant ark or be a zoologist on this ark, but you know what? God has gifted you with something. And if he has gifted you with something and he has called you to do something, let me tell you, if he can gift and call and enable Noah and his family to build this ark and to do what he did, he can enable you to do anything. The Bible tells us in Matthew 19, with men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Yes, to the secular mind, building an ark and maintaining those animals is impossible. Bill and I said that. This is impossible. It's not feasible. It could not happen. But with God, it is possible, even in natural means. Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So what that means for us, my friends, my brothers and my sisters, is that if God is calling you to do something and it seems impossible to your, your mind, rest assured, it is possible with God. And if the story of Noah and his ark is the literal, historical truth, then imagine what you could do. Imagine what you could do for his name's sake. So I'm going to leave you with that. I ask if the worship team will come forward. Next week, we will cover the geological argument. I'll spend the whole time doing that. Let's say a word of prayer together. Father, thank you for your word. Lord, thank you for giving us eyes to see, ears to hear, brains to think, uh, souls to worship you with. Father, I thank you for all the ways that you've created us. And I thank you, Lord, for your word. I thank you for the challenge of your word. Help us, Lord, as the obstacles seem too great, as the task seems too hard. Help us to be reminded of Noah. And the fact that him and his family were able to accomplish this for your will. Help us, Lord, in, in whatever circumstance we're in, whatever task we have, whether big or small. Help us, Lord, to approach it with the same mindset, knowing that with you all things are possible, that we can, we can do it because of you. So empower us, give us confidence and strength that we need to accomplish your will according to our age and our time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.